A. Baker, author, professor, and editor, joins me today on the Uniweb interview show. C. A. Baker, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. So, you're <laughs> writing a book. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Treaty, I know, right? I'm. This is me. Treaty and Treason <laughs> is the, is the <laughs> yeah. book that you're writing. Uh, scheduled yeah. to come out July 30th of this year. Yes. Treaty and Treason, uh, my debut novel. Um, it's high fantasy, but low magic. I tell people that because everybody gets like an expectation for a lot of magic sometimes. But it's been really interesting writing that way. Well, yeah, explain that a little bit for me, if you wouldn't mind, like the high fantasy. So in what regards in low magic? Well, it's high fantasy because it's in a completely different world that's completely made up, restructured um, from my imagination. Uh, and it's very medieval setting, um, has a medieval type setting, even though it doesn't follow those restrictions completely. Um but it's low magic in that there are people in the world that have magic and can do magic, but it's not centered around the main character. Um, okay. And they're kind of in the background. Uh, there are some secondary characters that can do magic, uh, but it comes at a relatively high cost most of the time. Uh, mm. So it's not something that's very prevalent in the world. So the ma the rules of magic in this world are different than proposed in a lot of other fantasy books then? Yes, uh, it's very restrictive in this world. It, there's not a whole lot of like major magic like spell casting and things that can sure. be done. There, there's some things like enchantments and things like that and blessings and curses and stuff like that can still be done, but it's kind of limited. Was this done intentionally? And Treaty and Treason? Yes. Um, I wanted the focus to be more in this world, more on the like political intrigue and the lives mm -hmm. of the characters. And I normally actually for like short stories and things I've written in the past, it's been high magic and magic's been like the main focus. This is the first one I've written that hasn't been high magic uh, or magic focused. And I'm actually liking it. I, the characters become more real and you get to know them better. <laughs> so when they um, can't just magic their way out of something. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> There's no deus ex machina that can just come from their fingertips. So, yeah, and, yeah. And life gets better immediately. Yeah. Or well, I guess you, you have to discover like the character has to discover some real other inner strength besides saying some magical words, right? Yeah, and I'm having fun playing around with fight scenes and stuff like that, and like physical fight scenes using different weapons and stuff like that. So it's been so, really fun in that regard. That's that's very cool. So with the you said you created a whole new world. Is this did you like draw maps or anything like that? I mean, is this? Uh... I actually do. Um, I draw and paint as a hobby, and so I can't not draw maps when I create a world. And it actually got super detailed, and it was really yeah. hard not to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> um, sure. But I pulled back after a little while and just created kind of the bare bones of the different sections of the continent and different rulers, and then I just kind of stopped there until, unless I needed something for the story. Right, kind of. Uh, figuring out how much you actually was required to tell the story. <laughs> yeah, rather than get lost in in the creation and you know become Tolkien esque, and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Well, then you get you get down to a point where you're like drawing people actually walking on a hill, and you're like, okay, this is too detailed. <laughs> like, and then yeah. you got and then you have to tell their story. Like, why are they on that hill? And you exactly. need, like, the whole it's story. like, wait, what told. are these random people you're showing? Like, why are they here? And then I'll have one story for every citizen in the world, and I won't be able to write <laughs> that. <in the> book. <laughs> so. You should write a video game. Uh-oh. Lost you. Hello? So sorry about that. Um, my okay. phone went off. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Um... But, uh, yeah, I was just, um... I was saying you should write a video game. Oh, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, that would actually be really cool. I feel like I could explore all the rabbit holes uh, in a video game, like all the little Easter eggs and stuff. and All the um, side quests. Yeah. <laughs> my my husband actually plays a lot of like Fallout 4 and stuff like that. So uh, he definitely like explores some of like the weird things the characters can do. Yeah, that would be fun. Um with with this I, I know you said it's July 30th and you're still you're still working on it. Are you publishing this yourself or is this going through a publishing house? I am self-publishing. Um okay. I've been doing research on it for several years now um while I've been trying to figure out which story I want to make my debut novel. I have several stories um already kind of basically outlined and I definitely want to explore those eventually but i was trying to figure out which one to do first um and so i picked this one um and i've been researching how to do all of the, like who to hire for formatting how to hire an editor <laughs> there's so much on the back end that a lot of people don't realize and um i didn't realize at first either so but it's been fun it's been fun <laughs> It's a journey, right? We have to go on our own little uh, hero's quest to figure out how the heck to get a book read. <laughs> not even, not just published, but like, how do I get somebody to read this thing? Exactly. And it's, it's so doable, too. It's just, there's a lot of steps. There's a, a whole lot of steps. Yeah. So. Um, I, w- I want to get back. I kind of, I kind of went off on a trail there i want to get back to the characters in the book so i'm looking at the cover right now the cover is beautiful um who who did the cover for you if you can say um i i hired um the lady who does drop dead designs Mm -hmm. um and i had never heard of her before until i saw um i think i saw something about her website in another youtube video another writer's video and so i checked her out and just she was on budget for someone who does indie who self-publishes um but still made very very beautiful covers i had tried the super cheap route with like fiverr and stuff and you can get okay uh, but i really wanted something right out of the gate that was really going to attract readers and i know that's so important (laughs) Yeah, and it looks incredibly professional. Thank you. It, yeah, is, she so, did a great job. Is the the woman on the cover, and nobody can see this right now, so I'll I'll put it in the video. I'll put it in the video so they'll be able to they'll have an idea. Um, <laughs> is that the main character? Yes. Your idea. That is the main. Yes. Um, that is. Uh, Does she Niva know? Huh? Does she know? Does that woman know that she's the main character of your book? You ever wonder? Probably not. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> if she if she knew that she was the main character of my book, she would probably run screaming somewhere else, <laughs> anywhere to Uh-oh. get away from me. I'm probably um, one of the uh, one of the things like in this world is that like there's kind of a weird relationship with like fate and things trying to like play puppet master. People don't tend to like that. Yeah. Um, so like if she knew I was playing puppet master with all the characters, she'd probably freak out. You'd be pretty pissed. So <laughs> what is what what's her name? What's the main character's name? Her name is Niva. Mm-hmm. So N I V A H. Um so her name is Niva and she is the heir to um the ruling position of the Northlands, uh, which is where most of the story takes place. Okay. And is this all done from a first person perspective or a third person? Uh, it's third person, but it's close. Uh, third person okay. limited. Um, so it stays with her um, and kind of what she encounters. Um, so the things that she doesn't see or learn about, you really don't see at the same time. So it does sure. follow her closely. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, so for Treaty and Treason, how what was the process like for you writing this in terms of like how long it took and, and uh, what happened, how you grew through it? Yeah. um, It was uh, the first novel length story that I wrote um, from beginning to end. 
And planning it out, I had planned for it to have a lot more, you know, to go through the plot. But when I wrote the first draft, I realized, I got like a third through the first draft, realized that I have three books outlined, not one. (laughs) So I had to go back to the drawing board, take my 45,000 words that I thought was just part one of a novel and restructure it fill it out and it became treaty and treason so there's there's it's a trilogy so there is oh, two cool. more books in the works so yeah wow what was that what was that like when you figured that out was were you like oh my god <laughs> what the hell was i doing <laughs> yeah i was i was a little bit intimidated by the fact that oh no i have three books and the main realization came when i kind of hit a writing wall at the end of that part one and at the end of that part i realized that i had a full story arc already and it ended and that's why i was kind of floundering because i didn't know where to pick up a new arc and i'm like i really shouldn't be struggling to pick up a new arc if i'm not at the end of a book so i was like yeah i'm i'm definitely at the end of a book and i i was just kind of blown away but at the same time i was like okay well, this makes sense because if I go back and I fill out, you know, for a second draft of this section, I'm going to have 80 to 90,000 words. So, you know, I don't want a book that's 300,000 words. That's not going to work. So. Not typically. <laughs> Those are I mean, even just for, so intimidating. It is <laughs> to have to to have to start over on this scale. I would just I was not anticipating that. Um, I'm hoping to kind of avoid that later because I'm kind of getting used to the story structure, outlining, doing beats and things like that. It's coming more naturally now, but this is the first one that I use that type of structure. And I think I just tried to cram too much into one outline and yeah. ended up with three books instead. <laughs> well, it's, it's a blessing once you got it outlined once you got it figured out how you're going to cut it up right because now you have three three books you can write which is very cool are you are you currently working on the second one at all or is are you simply um, focused I'm on doing book a one? Little, i'm doing a little bit of research and yeah. plotting and care and world and character building for the second one um funny thing is is a lot of writers suffer from this and i do too the the shiny new thing syndrome yeah. Um, and I actually had a idea come into my head for a second trilogy that will be, or at least a second novel. I don't know if it'll be a trilogy, but a second novel that will actually be in the same world, but completely different characters. So Mm. that actually, you know, started form forming, but I'm trying to put it off, um, until I get this. You know, really going. It's so hard to do though, right? Like when you get that voice of inspiration, it's like, oh, it this is. Will be so cool. and this, this one was just so vivid too. I think getting used to this longer format of a novel format and yeah. getting used to the ins and outs of what the characters do and how they interact and what really fills out, you know, 80 to 120,000 words. Um, I think getting used to that has got my brain kind of thinking in that mode. And now I'm getting like other book inspirations, like that fit that format. And it's just, yeah, there's so many, um, that's not even including ones that aren't in this world. And, you know, one sci-fi universes that you're, you're thinking of creating. Um, I have one sci-fi that I'm really passionate about, but I've had to keep, putting it aside a little bit because sci-fi is not my go-to when I write. Um, But this story is just begging to be told. So I really want to focus on it and do right by it. So I haven't had, I feel the experience as a writer to really tackle it yet, but I'm hoping to tackle that at least maybe next year or something like that and start that as well. Cause I like having an A story and a B story. Sure. to kind of work on um, especially when you might get a little bit stuck on one you can kind of work a little bit on the other and go back but, uh, yeah and it kind of opens things up for you it um, does. so you're but you're, you're also a professor of 
I'm not sure what yet, but you're gonna tell me. And then you're all, <laughs> and you also are an editor. So, first off, what are you a professor of? I am a profess professor. To know? Professor. Um, well, hopefully, I know enough about uh, English language arts and literature. Ah. So I teach, um, you know, at a community college and at a university. Um, and I teach uh, English 101, 102, 105, and also a literature course. But I teach a sci-fi literature course, and it's actually really fun. That does sound fun. Have you? How long have you been uh, teaching for? Uh, three years now. Okay. What have you noticed in the three years you've been teaching? Like, has it changed since you were in school? How the process of these students grasping information? Um, and I only ask that because I see the way information is being taken in and being presented now, like with the internet and um, like Twitter, I feel like gives you these blurbs and text messages. We all have these very short blurb attention spans. Are you noticing a difference in the way students are learning? Definitely. The, um, the attention span, we just, we're bombarded with so much. Our, yeah. I mean, on a basic level, our brains can't take all of that in. And, you know, just becoming um, kind of used to that and getting in a pattern of dealing with those like little blurbs, like you said, just constantly coming at you. I feel like, um, especially dealing with teaching academic writing, I feel like the tendency to really research something, to really critically think and critic and close read something is not something that students know how to do very well. Right. Um, and even at the college level, you know, I've even asked and said, you know, how many of you know what critical thinking is? And had one person, you know, raise their hand. So, and, but I, I do teach that. I teach that because what I know is critical there's a thinking. Right. Huh? <laughs> what is critical thinking? Critical thinking is just t not taking things at face value, questioning, researching, just, but, and again, a lot of it boils down to that kind of instant gratification type yeah. pattern that we get into, yeah. especially now. And if we can't just make one click and find out something or one Google, um, we usually over, stop man. researching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, Google. Um, but it's it's a struggle to get past that wall of habit and kind of show students that there's a different way to do it in a way that can really benefit them in the long run. So even beyond writing. Um, sure. And a lot of my students are not English majors, so it's a different crowd. Yeah. Well, because we're what we're it says that we're full. We, we have so much knowledge, but so little wisdom in, in today's age. I mean, we're just like bombarded with knowledge, but the wisdom is like absolutely gone. And I, yeah. I, wisdom, I guess, is truly knowing something to an extent where it can be practical and you can teach somebody else. You can put it into action and you can have experience with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it it's. It's it's really neat because I, I always have this uh, fear of talking to teachers uh, because I was a terrible student. You're not afraid of talking to me, right? I'm always terrified of teachers. They uh, they they know that I am a problem child. As soon as they look at me, I feel like they're like, "This is this guy right here is going to be be an issue." Um, <laughs> but but English and, and literature has always been something that's fascinated me because we're building a visual story in somebody's mind as opposed to like throwing pictures at them. Um, when you're writing, when you're creating, what do you find some of the most aesthetically pleasing things are to you to, to write about? Um, I think writing about like the little details that people do in their daily life that say so much about them. Mm. I mean, just the detail of, you know, you read about a character who is, uh, tying their shoe, but the shoestring breaks, and you notice that their foot is slightly coming through the uh, sole of the shoe. That just says volumes. Those tiny little yeah. details you don't have to give much. Um, yeah. Just a little bit of that can tell you this person's down on their luck. There's something going on yeah. here, and 
you're going to find out more probably. That's so cool. It's, it's, I, I love being able to paint the picture like that. Cause you did when you started, when you started talking about that, you painted the picture of, you know, either this little kid or this person who's just like got these beat up shoes. <laughs> who's just like the scene was gray in my mind. It's such a cool thing to be able to do. How long have you been, how long have you actually been writing for? I mean, I know you said you've written some short stories um, and stuff like that, but. Well, actually writing stories and stuff down probably around, you know, high school level. It's probably been, oh uh, goodness. It's been, I don't know, I'm going to date myself about eight, about 18 years, maybe. <laughs> so for probably for about 18 <laughs> years, but, um. The uh, but really and truly, it's funny because I went down the path of wanting to do art for a long time, and I sort of ignored the writing that I like to do on the side. I never put any like real attention into it until in high school, a teacher kind of told me, Hey, you should probably enter this contest and write a story for this. And I won, so I was like, That's interesting. <laughs> And I never really, like, I didn't realize that my stories were any good. I just liked writing them for me. Um, and then I realized, hey, other people might want to read these. And I had always made up stories, even from being really little, and um, ghost stories mainly to scare other kids. <laughs> nice. uh, but I, I made up stories, but I never wrote them down until, you know, high school, but um, it's been a journey realizing that this is what I want to do with my life. So, yeah. Are there certain rules that you live by when it comes to writing? Um, not too much, not hard and fast, I guess. Um, but just that I've come to the realization that I have to put it as one of my priorities to get it done. And yeah. when I, when I don't do that, I end up, I guess, not feeling great about <laughs> stuff. I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm one of those people that now I have to write. I feel like I have to spend some time with these internal characters and sure. get them down on pages. And when I don't, it can kind of make me feel off. Um, so I've had to learn. You do NaNoWriMo, don't, don't you? Yes. Okay. Um, I do. I see it on your Instagram all the time. <laughs> I see you talking yeah. about it on Instagram all the time. I don't know. I've, I've had somebody else explain to me what NaNoWriMo is, but it was like at least two months ago, so I completely forgot. What <laughs> What is NaNoWriMo again? Nan NaNoWriMo stands for National Novel Writing Month, um, and the original NaNoWriMo is in November, but they do camp, two other camps, I think, throughout the year. One's in April, and I think one's over the summer. Uh, but NaNoWriMo in November is a 50,000 word book from the 1st of November to the end of November. Uh, and okay. it's a writing challenge. Um, I used, I've actually never quite gotten to the 50,000 mark and I'm okay with that. I'm one of those people that, that I'm okay with that, but I use NaNoWriMo to push myself as much as I can yeah. to get as many words as I can. And it's a great like community event. And it's just, just seeing everybody else really try to get those words in kind of pushes you to do more than you normally would. Sure. Do you ever use like word sprints? Where, um, you, know what that, you know what I mean I when I say to, that? Yeah. I want to, I actually really want to do word sprints. I did a couple of word sprints one NaNoWriMo, um, I went into a chat, they have chat rooms and do like virtual word sprint uh, sessions. Yeah. And I did a couple of those. Um, I think the way that I write is not quite conducive to the way that they had it set up. Um, but I'd like to peck? try. Huh? Do you hunt and peck? Oh, no, I can type really fast. <laughs> I know. Um, it's just, I... I have not figured out a way for myself to not edit while I type. Mm. So, and that's the big thing with the word sprints is you, you just type, if you misspell something or capitalize something wrong, you just go. And yeah, 
I think that's why I'm able to write. Like, I always, people always get surprised when they're like, you just wrote a thousand, two thousand words in like 15 minutes. I'm like, yeah, it was yeah. easy. I don't know. Why aren't you doing that? <laughs> but I'm just like, put the words out yeah. there. I'll, I'll come back to it later. But oh, you're, yeah. an, edit, you're an editor too. Yeah. And that's the thing. I can turn down my inner editor, but I can't turn it completely off, unfortunately. Sure. So. Yeah. It's like a governor on a, on a golf cart or something. On a golf cart? A governor. Like, you know how they put the governor on the golf cart so it doesn't go over, like, 20 miles an hour? Yep. Yeah, so you don't hurt yourself on the golf course, basically. But I'm pretty much, like, flying over the hills. You're going <laughs> to you're gonna enjoy the, your day of golfing as I careen off into the pond. <laughs> and, and end up with muck on you that you got to clean off later. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, yeah. I feel I feel like at this point, after years of trial and error, that I've gotten to a point where I can turn that editor down so low that, yes, I'm kind of avoiding the glaring errors that are really going to nag me. But I've gotten to the point where I can, if I see something big I would spend a lot of time trying to fix, I'll put a note on it in the application that I'm writing in, whether it's Scrivener or Google Docs or whatever. Um, I use Scrivener and Google Docs. I love them, but I'll put a note on it and then fix it later and just keep writing. So being able to do that has really, really helped. And it's gotten to a pretty good balance between writing quickly and my inner editor. (laughs) Yeah. And you, but you have other people look, you have other, another person edit your, your work for you as after you do the first run through, right? Yes. Uh, And most people don't realize this, but even professors and editors actually need other editors to edit their stuff (laughs) because and you can't like you can't see everything. You see what you intended to write when you're reading through it and someone else is going to see with fresh eyes, you know, what you don't see. It's a blind spot. We don't even realize we have the blind spot. It's just there. Um, Yeah. So do you, do you professionally edit as well? Like, are you editor for hire? I am. Um, I do a little bit, mostly throughout the summer um, at this point, just because, you know, writing and being a professor are my two main things. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I have done some proofreading and copy editing for a couple of indies. um, And I definitely want to do more in the future. So I am going to this summer also take, you know, a couple of more uh, editing jobs and things like that. So if anybody is interested in hiring you as an editor, how do they go about finding you and, and talking to you about that? Well, um, they can contact me through my website or anywhere on social media, really. Um, my email is also uh, listed. It's uh, cabakerwrites at gmail. And my website just went up, and it is um, authorcabaker.com, so they can also reach me through there. I don't have anything up there just yet on my editing, but hopefully I will be adding pages for that soon. Uh, But they can always email me, you know, if they have questions. And I, I really want to, with my editing, to cater to indies, make it, you know, both affordable and effective. Um, so to try to do a little more than, I guess, the basic edit would cover, uh, just because, you know, indies oftentimes have a limited time frame that they're doing editing. Um, they might not have it as structured as traditional published works. And I'm finding that, um, even when I do just proofreading for somebody, I can't actually help but also do a little bit of copy edit or something along the lines. If I see something, I'm going to fix it. So it's kind of like, you know, if you sign up to get proofreading from me, you're probably going to get proofreading and a little bit of copy, you know, at the same time, because I I can't leave it. (laughs) Sure. I I think with the indie, with the, the whole indie route going independently published, I think it's such a, awesome um, field that we're we're able to see so many more creative ways of storytelling as well um but also opportunities for people in the field like you're editing 
and that kind of thing that are able to kind of create a whole new business for themselves, a whole new um, way to make the living more than just like, because I know, I think for all of us, I know for me, I want to become a full-time writer, full-time, you know, um, weirdo on the internet kind of thing. And there's all those, those routes are becoming available to us because the, of the tools that are now coming out, uh, which is, which is really great. And I, so I commend you for, for taking that, that initiative and helping out other indie authors because it's, it's, it's tough to uh, just put our work out. I didn't have an editor. I had no clue what was going on when I first wrote my book and I used Grammarly and that was it. And yeah. I mean, the story's the story hangs in there, but there's a lot of things, a ton of stuff that I missed that I just yeah. didn't, you know, I had no clue about. That, that fresh set of eyes, a, a lot of people actually use uh, beta readers, which that's great, uh, using beta readers. Although, I would argue that using beta readers is more for like content things. Like, is your character consistent? Is there something they do that doesn't seem right? Yeah. Um, is there something you say that, you know, or is your character suddenly talking to someone who died the last chapter? You know, <laughs> is there yeah. some inconsistency right. there? Um, but in inconsistencies are something beta readers can catch and are really good at catching most of the time, especially if you have, you know, 10 plus beta readers. Um, but that can be hard to organize sometimes too. Um, but that editor is going to put that final polish on it, uh, yeah. and make sure if, if anything slipped through the cracks of beta reading of, you know, having a critique partner, if anything slipped through that editor is going to catch that. Yeah. Cause I didn't realize how it's like we, we spend all this time crafting and creating like a baby and then we throw it out there and it's not ready to survive on its own and one of the hardest things for me is was realizing that this story was so important to me and i didn't do justice in terms of the editing process and people i can lose people that way so i can lose people from the story that way and that's such a hard it's like a gut-wrenching thing like ah, it's hard it's like oh no they're attacking my baby um yeah. but it's really just like <laughs> taking the time to get yeah. somebody like you or uh, these other people and have somebody critically look at it. And there are people who make every effort to, whether it's paying in payments, especially if you get a big edit done, like a, a yeah. developmental edit or something, you know, if you get a big edit done, a lot of the people who work with indies are willing to do payments. They're willing to work with indies and really make it possible for that to happen. Yeah. Um, and or do something like with the copy editing plus a few other, you know, maybe developmental suggestions and things along with it that make it more affordable because a copy edit is going to be a lot more affordable than a dev edit. So, yeah. Yeah. And this is some information I wish I would have known prior and just like taking a deep breath and taking the time to look for it as opposed to being so because I was so like, <gasps> I have to, every, everyone has to read this, but like the, the, for us just to like take a deep breath, calm down, put it through the process. So it's the best it can possibly be. And that, and that is the point of an editor. A lot of people don't, a lot of people don't want to like do the editor stage of it. Um, I mean, some people don't feel like they can, or maybe they don't know how, but some people avoid it just because they don't want somebody to pick apart their baby. And really, truly, that editor is like training the baby, you know, right. it's helping yeah. the baby. Um, you know, it's bringing it up to five year old status or more, you know, so yeah. it, can, it can survive on its own, like your metaphor. And it's just, yeah, it's making it better, even though all that red, you know, I don't like using red. Even when I grade papers, I use green or blue or something like that, because I know yeah. that red is like this huge anxiety so trigger for so many people. Um, it just says so stop writing mind. forever to most people. <laughs> Never write oh, again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a struggle though to be that critical because you know being critical is going to help that book or help that paper um, when you know that it's going to kind of sting a little bit. Um, when that person who wrote it reads that, um, 
but finding that balance between being critical of the work and being supportive and constructive of the work is kind of what an editor has to balance. Yeah. yeah. It takes a village to raise a book. <laughs> yeah, it does. It actually does. I mean, it takes cover designers and formatters and editors. And yeah, and I feel like we, as, as an indie author, like we get in a mindset of, well, I have to do this all on my own, but we still have to go through the processes that are necessary to put out good work. Like I'm not strong at every, I, I can be a great storyteller, but if I'm terrible at grammar and I don't know how to design a cover, like I need help in those areas and not being afraid to ask for that help is so important. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, yeah, that's so true with self-publishing, especially I've, I started out wanting to try to wear all the hats yep. and just can't, um, right. I mean, not effectively. I mean, you could try, uh, but effect to be as effective as you can. You look uh, like a crazy person with a lot of hats on is what happens. That's exactly. <laughs> just like, like lots a of bunch hats. Of hats. Um, but, you know, it's it's not something that everybody can do. Everybody have their, has their strengths and weaknesses. So it's just what are your strengths? Can you do formatting? Can you do, you know, story building? Can you do um, uh, cover design? If you can do multiple of the different things that a book needs that's great but it doesn't mean you're going to get all of them right. um so there's still even if you can do two three four there's still going to be a couple of places where you're still going to need to hire somebody so yeah it's good to network it is it's one of the the things that i feel like as writers we we're, we feel like we're supposed to be locked in our on our rooms or our offices or whatever and be typing away all the time never time for friends or building anything but like any any success in life comes from knowing other people and knowing who we're trying to reach like knowing our audience is so important connecting with your audience is so important and not just like reaching out and like talking to your audience but like how am i connecting with them in this story um yeah so connecting connection is so important in, in networking in the writing community and are there are there things that you do in terms of networking uh, with other writers? Do you have like a writing group that you go to or anything like that? Well, i have not a writing group per se, but there's there's writing communities on Twitter, um, yep. hashtag writing community on Twitter, and then a bunch of people on Instagram uh, that have just been great as far as sharing their own journeys, uh, which is just free experience. I mean. Just paying yeah. attention to writers' own journeys as they go through the publishing process, as they go through marketing and all kinds of other things that we thought we'd never have to handle <laughs> as writers. Yeah. Um, but getting to see that from other people's experiences can, I, I mean, why not just use it? I mean, and getting to know them and talk to them. And there's a huge writing community on Twitter. Um, so I've been a part of that. Instagram's a little bit new newer to me uh mm -hmm. but i'm getting into that and talking back and forth i've met some really great um authors um even uh met you through one of those authors on instagram yeah. So, um yeah it's just all interconnected and you just gotta you just gotta talk to people and be real out there so yeah it's amazing what happens when we admit that we don't know something and just become willing to learn something new like we can take our games to the next level like admit that we want to be successful and that we don't know how to necessarily do it like that's what i'm trying to work on the most is like i don't yeah. know how to do it i don't know <laughs> but like telling myself i don't know is like my ego's like shut up man we got this <laughs> <laughs> yeah the ego is not always the most helpful thing when it comes to to learning things no but um but the funny thing is, is you can kind of satisfy that ego, be like, OK, well, I have to admit, I don't know this, but guess what? We're good enough. We can figure this out. We can learn this stuff and we can find the people who know it and learn from them or, you know, whatever we have to do. That's right. Become friends with your ego. Be like, hey, buddy, we're going to learn this, man, because you're smart. Exactly. He's like, yeah, I am smart. I can learn it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want to give you the final word here. I want to I want to know in terms of your legacy for writing your career. 
Um, what do you want people to know about you? Let's say a thousand years from now, somebody stumbles upon treaty and treason, and it's the only thing they get to know about you. What do you hope they get from it? I hope they get like a picture of like real life for many of the characters and real, real struggle between, you know, relationships and duty and, um, you know, just, just the basic conflict of what's going on for these characters. And I'm hoping they get from it that I understand you know, the human experience and different aspects of the human experience. Cause I, I really think that's what comes through in a lot of fiction is just, that's what gets us that connection between, it doesn't matter if it's a fantasy world or sci-fi or anything like that, but that human experience, that emotion, those reactions to things happening, that, that connection I'm hoping will come through. Awesome. Wow. Well, C.A. Baker, Treaty and Treason, release date, July 30th of this year. Hopefully, we can can stay up to date by following you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, which I'll have links to all that in the description of the video. Also, your website, authorcabakerwrites.com. Uh, just authorcabaker.com authorcabaker.com I'll have a link to that as well Um, thank you so much for your time I really do appreciate it it's been a pleasure talking to you you're welcome thank you for having me okay No, (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) I never know I don't know how to end things Um, well see you later